Hello. Today we are going to be uh, back in chapters, Hebrews chapter 3 a little bit and beginning chapter 4. I know I've been breaking these up by chapters. I'm not sure if that's the best way of doing this, to be honest, uh, because this book is kind of written in a way that's not necessarily organized around our chapters. So I wanted to kind of back up a little bit and, and kind of try to lay chapter 3 and 4 out in a little different way. Um, so in chapter 3, if you're looking at the text, beginning there in verse 7, chapters Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7, going through chapter 4, verse 13, is an expansion or, or a commentary. I'm not sure what the best word would be used to describe this, but the Hebrew writer takes this text and he expands on it and he applies it to to the to the time where he was writing. He applies it to those who were living in his time r- roughly 2000 years ago. So he takes this he takes Psalm 95. And Psalm 95 itself actually looks back to the time of Moses and the Exodus from Egypt. And so we have kind of uh, this text looking back First of all, to the Exodus time when Israel was leaving Egypt, but also going back and quoting Psalm 95. So Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7 through chapter 4, verse 13 is all an expansion of this text. And as you go through this text, you're going to know some key ideas, some key phrases, key words. And I put some of these on the screen real quickly. And you can tell, by the way, this is a real serious uh, class today because I used a parchment keynote backdrop. So you can tell I'm a meaning business. That that parchment backdrop really tells you I'm serious today. So anyways, as we go through this text, I want you to notice this repeated word uh, that keeps on occurring, today. And this word today is going to be kind of important because first of all, it shows that there was another opportunity, another chance, another opportunity. And it also is important because it makes it relevant to the time of the writing. Uh, And so he wasn't just talking about some ancient document when he was writing this. He was making an application for those readers at that time. You'll also notice this word rest will occur. And again, this is kind of what we talked about in chapter 3 last time. But this word rest continues to occur several times. And these are words that, again, are introduced to us in in Psalm chapter 95. And then there's an idea. And I use the word idea because it's not simply one word here. There's an idea of unfaithfulness an idea of disobedience. And so you'll see several different Greek words uh, that are used to describe either unfaithfulness itself or disobedience, which are are, are obviously different words, but you can see some similar thoughts to them. So anyways, as we go through this, I want you to kind of notice some of these phrases. So we're going to go into the text a little bit right now. So you can follow along on the screen or you can open up your own Bible if you would like. So first of all, I want you just to quickly notice this word today as it continues to occur. So he says, today, if you hear his voice, and he references, he goes, therefore, as the Holy Spirit says. So again, the Hebrew writer is quoting the book of Psalm 95 and attributing this writing to the Holy Spirit. We talked about that a little bit last time. That's very interesting. But then he noticed how he picks up this word today and he carries it through the rest of chapter three and into chapter four. This is all, again, expanding on that Psalm 95 text. I want to draw your attention to another uh, word here, the word rest, which I already alluded to. He says, they shall not enter my rest. So meaning the land of promise, right? The land of promise was given to Israel when they left Egypt. It was given to Abraham back in Genesis chapter 12, this promise of a land, this promise of a resting place. And so this promise was there, but God says, they shall not enter my rest. Well, why were they not going to enter his rest? Well, that goes back to that word unfaithfulness or unbelieving, disbelieving, disobedience. And we'll look at that word in a minute. But first of all, notice this word rest and how the Hebrew writer picks up this word and carries it through in these uh, in these chapters. Here again, we see this word occurring, uh, I believe it's 11 times in this section. So over and over, this idea of rest, a place of rest, uh, this concept of rest. And again, this rest is is directly related to the faithfulness of those people. He says back here in this text, he says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. So don't be like them. Don't be like these people. As he's talking, the Hebrew writer is talking to those Christian readers 2,000 years ago. He says, today, don't be like those people. Don't harden your heart. See, that's unfaithfulness. That's that idea of unfaithfulness. Don't harden your hearts as in the rebellion. 
Verse 9, your fathers put me to the test. Verse 10, therefore I was provoked with that generation. And I swore in my wrath. Verse 11, they shall not enter my rest. So then he goes from this and he begins to encourage them. This is an encouragement. This is an exhortation. Don't be like them. Verse 12, take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an unbelieving heart. This is the idea of an unfaithful heart. And I kind of like that translation a little better. An unfaithful heart. What happens with an unfaithful heart? It leads you to fall away from the living God. So here again is this exhortation. But exhort one another every day as long as it is called today. So here we have this, this idea of an unbelieving, unfaithful heart. And again, there's other words that are used kind of for this concept, this idea. Uh, but this is definitely an idea, this unfaithfulness, unbelieving. And again, even a different word, uh, but disobedience. We'll see that in a minute as well. He says, uh, as long as it is called today that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin, for we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold. So here's this idea of being faithful. So the contrasting idea, right? Don't be unfaithful, but be faithful. Hold to your, your original confidence firm to the end. Hold to this confidence. Then again, he quotes back from Psalm 95 today. Do not harden your hearts. Don't become unfaithful in your hearts. For who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not those who left Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear? Again, all of these are pointing back. These are phrases pointing back to that Psalm 95 quote. And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest? but to those who were disobedient. So again, here's a different word. But again, these are pointing to the, the problem with the people that God brought out of Egypt. Don't be like these people who were unfaithful, disobedient, rebellious. Don't be like them. So we that, so sorry. So we see that they were unable to enter. Enter what? Enter God's rest because of unbelief, unfaithfulness. They were unable to enter. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands. So there is still this idea of a rest. And that's why the word today is relevant. Today is making this message relevant to those readers 2,000 years ago. And it makes it relevant to us today. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear, lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. Now watch verse 2. For good news came to us just as to them. This word good news is, is, is the Greek word euangelion. It's the same word that is used for the gospel, for the gospel message, this good news, this message, this news of rest. It came to them, but the message, the gospel didn't do them any good. Why not? Because they were not united by faith with those who listened. Now watch verse six here. Since therefore it remains for some to enter it, there still is an opportunity to enter rest. And those who formerly received the good news, the gospel message, those who, the Israelites who received this gospel message, they did not enter. They failed to enter. Why? Because of disobedience. So again, we see this word, this idea, disobedient, unfaithfulness. This good news was brought to them. This message of salvation, this message of a place of rest was brought to them. But they failed to enter it because of their unbelieving unfaithful hearts who were not willing to listen to the message. So today, and again, now the Hebrew writer uh, expands on the Holy Spirit. You know, the Holy Spirit is what he said up here, right? The Holy Spirit says in verse 7, and here he says, today saying through David. So the Holy Spirit said through David, which is kind of interesting as you look at how the Bible came to be. The Holy Spirit said through David, today if you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. See, the problem was the rest that Joshua was going to give them, right? Coming into the promised land, you know, Moses led them up there, but Joshua was going to take them in. So the rest that Joshua was going to give them in taking into the land of Canaan was not going to be a permanent rest. So if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for who? Well, it's for the faithful, for the obedient. And he'll use here a different phrase. It's for the people of God. 
For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. So, you know, there's this idea here in this chapter that there is a reward to those who serve faithfully. Now, we have not yet entered that rest, those of us who are still working, those of us who are still striving on earth, trying to do his task. That rest still is theirs, is there, though, for us. It is still there for us. The rest remains. It's ours to take. What are we going to do? He then, it, he then wraps this kind of his, this section of scripture up here in verse 11 with another exhortation. The rest remains. It's right there. Verse 11, let us therefore strive. And this word strive means to put forth an effort to do work. This does not mean we're saved by works, of course. But it means that to enter this rest requires work. It requires energy. Requires effort. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. So what does it take to enter the rest that God has promised? When, when that time comes for us to be done on earth and we've, we've, done, we've, we've lived our life, what does it take? Well, it, it, takes us, it takes an effort on our part. We need to strive to enter that rest. What did Jesus say? The way is narrow. The path that leads to eternal life, it's narrow. It's a difficult path. Strive to enter that rest. So first of all, we have to strive to enter that rest, number one. Number two, we have to be obedient. See, you can fall through disobedience, so we have to be obedient to enter that rest. So we have to strive to enter the rest. We have to be obedient to enter the rest. Now look at verse 12. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. So first of all, I know that people frequently use this and say this is talking about the Word of God, meaning the Scripture. But I don't believe that's true. I believe this is talking about Jesus Christ. First of all, Jesus Christ is called the Word in John chapter 1. We know that. But it seems to fit better contextually if the, if the idea the Word of God is talking about Jesus Christ. The Jesus Christ, the Word of God, is living. And if you look here at verse 13, and no creature is hidden from His sight. This is a... Uh, this this plural this pronoun sorry it's plural this pl pronoun if I can talk correctly is masculine pronoun. There's no creature hidden from his sight. Whose sight? The word of God's sight. All are naked and exposed to the eyes of Him. H him who? Jesus Christ, the Word of God. No creature is hidden from His sight. All are naked and exposed to the eyes of Him, Jesus Christ, to whom we must give an account. And then if you look right at verse 14, and we're going to talk about 14 uh, next time. But 14 then expands on this. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast. And again, first of all, notice this phrase, hold fast. Again, demonstrating the need for faithfulness. But I want you to see this tie-in. The Word of God, His sight, nothing is, all are exposed to the eyes of Him. Let us then, uh, since then, we have a great high priest, Jesus Christ. This contextually, this word of God is pointing not to Scripture, but to Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He is living. He is active. He can see who we really are. He can see our heart, whether we are faithful or obedient or not. And so, therefore, the Hebrew writer encourages us to strive to enter that rest. Don't become disobedient in our work. Don't become unfaithful. Believe the promises of that rest. Believe in the high priest, the high priest that God has put there for us. We have a great high priest. There's no reason that we should fall because of disobedience and unfaithfulness. Anyway, thank you for your attention. I hope this has been encouraging to you guys. So let us strive then to enter that rest. And let's be obedient to, to Jesus Christ and live our life faithfully to him. You have a great day. God bless.